This is not a news flash, all right? But we are all selfish. I'm selfish. And I'm looking into your beautiful faces behind those masks. And I can tell you're not, you're not as selfish as I am, but there might be a little bit of selfishness in you. You know why? I know. Because we all look out for numero uno. We're always looking out for number one. <laughs> Take the now former coach of Notre Dame University's fighting Irish football team. Mm -mm. Had an incredible winning season this fall with his boys who played their hearts out for coach. In fact, they were just hours away from finding out whether they're going to be playing for the national championship. What are those playoff games going to be like? When the word leaked out after the fact that their coach had boarded a private jet shh, and flown, flew to a clandestine meeting with the officials of LSU, one of their great football rivals, Louisiana State University. Yep. And there he signed a deal. Before the season is over, before they've even been placed in playoff contention, he signed a deal to become the new head coach for the LSU football team, ostensibly because he didn't want to risk losing this job offer. Well, what was the job offer for, Dwight? Well, it was for $100 million over 10 years. If I do my arithmetic correctly, that's $10 million a year. The highest, the largest college football contract for a coach in the history of the game. And some of his boys found out about it on the news. Like I say, we're all selfish. I'm not talking just about the coach. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about you. We are faced with a pandemic of selfishness, and everybody here has been bitten by the deadly virus of self-worship. Numero uno, which is why we're going to have a hard time with what we're about to plunge into. I just know because of our bent, huh? We're going to try to grasp what we are about to read. It is, it is stunning in both its clarity and depth, but we're going to need to open up our minds to the Holy Spirit right now. And so I want to pray with you now. Father, send the Spirit, open our, our very selves to what we're about to see in this unusual Christmas story. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I say it's unusual because for this Advent season, we're tracking three of Paul's retelling the Christmas story. Galatians 4 last time. Today, Philippians 2, if you want to find it. Philippians 2. And next Sabbath, on Christmas Day, the best comes last. And I'll let you find out next Sabbath. All right, Philippians 2. So open your Bible, please, right now. Philippians 2, a little prison epistle. And these are not new words. You've read them before, but... Maybe they'll have a, a different hue and a glow about them by sharing them together in this season. All right, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Paul sets the table for the Christmas story by beginning in verse 3. All right, so I'm going to be in the New International Version, uh, Philippians chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 3. Do nothing, Paul writes. Keep in mind what we've just been talking about. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Wow. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And what mindset is that? Here it comes. Who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself, what's that word? He made himself nothing. Not numero uno, he made himself zero. He made himself nothing. The New, the New King James actually renders that line. He made himself of no reputation. Oh, that's hard for you and me, isn't it? Come on. Whenever we do something, and again, I'm talking about myself, and I'm, I risk talking about you, but whenever we do something, whether we give something or say something or think something or decide something or grab something or gossip something, we do it always to our own advantage, don't we? 
which by the way would be a classic definition of selfishness, doing things for, for my own advantage. I'm numero uno. We can all speak Spanish and we know the meaning. We do it academically. We do it professionally. Come on. Yeah, we got a colleague that we work with, we teach with, whatever. He, she puts out a, 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 a bit of research and we, we mm-hmm, yeah, not bad. We take it apart a little bit just to show that it's not that perfect. We just give a little hint now and then. Why do I do it? I have, I, by making you smaller, I'm going to make myself bigger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We do, it, we do it with social media. Mm-hmm. We get on social media, and we find this, this malicious, this delicious piece of gossip about somebody else. We hit forward. And there it goes. Hopefully, it makes me feel better than I do. Come on, we do it financially. Sure, we do. All of us doing our best to accumulate in this season of pandemic two, we accumulate as much as we can with seemingly total disregard of those who need our money. Get this, who need our money more than we do. Do you understand that? They need our money more than we need it. Oh, that's mine. I'm protecting this, numero uno. So where do we get this sickness, huh? Where do we get this sickness called selfishness? The uh, selfishness is just a code word for self-worship. Where did it come from? Oh, that's not rocket science. You can figure that one out real quickly. There's been somebody that has spent his entire life training you and me, teaching you and me, infecting you and me to look out for number one. Somebody has been at it the whole time we've been alive on this planet. Yep. So when Paul describes Christ, who did not consider equality with God something to be used, the old King James puts it this way, Christ, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus didn't grasp this business of being numero uno, but there was somebody in the courts above that grasped for that. He said, I have, I want that for me. I will be like the Most High. I will set my throne above the stars of God. Who's that somebody? It's Lucifer. Of course it is. He spent a lifetime, a very long lifetime, honing the virus of the pandemic of selfishness. Lucifer. Of course, we should have known it by his name. Isn't that right? Look at his name. What's the middle letter in Lucifer's name? I mean, is this, is this a coincidence or what? Of course, you can only do this in English. What's the middle? I, see, I, hear, some, I hear some children. Uh, boys and girls, what's the middle letter in Lucifer's name? Pride. All right, good. Let me put another word up. What's the middle letter in pride? What is it, boys and girls? I. What's the middle letter in sin? I. We have eye trouble. All of us. We knew that. Yeah, that's how we got infected from the get-go. By the way, here in the, here in the United States, we are on our way to a million cases of COVID-19 in America alone. But I got another stat for you, even more, more stunning. Here's the other stat. We are on our way on this planet to 8 billion cases of the deadly virus of selfishness infected with numero uno. Wow. For that very reason, Paul introduces what scholars say is probably the first, well, if not the first, one of the first Christian hymns sung during the time of the book of Acts in those little house churches. What we just read is the beginning of that hymn. Why does he introduce the hymn? Because it it, it contains the antidote to the deadly virus that is killing all of us. That's why. And by the way, this little Christmas story is actually a Christmas carol. That makes it a Christmas carol. It's the first Christmas carol. It's singing about the birth of Jesus. Let's read it again. So this is the preamble. In all your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now starts the hymn. Here it goes. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage? Rather, he made himself nothing, 
by taking the very nature of a slave, that's the word there, nature of a slave being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, as a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. And it goes even lower now, even death on a cross. Somewhere there in verse 7. Somewhere in the heart of verse 7 is this, is this capital I word that we speak, incarnation. It's a Latin word. Carnal in Latin means flesh. So enfleshment, incarnation, the enfleshment of God. The word became flesh. The American writer, Madeline Lingle, in her piece, A Sky Full of Children, describes the mystery of the incarnation this way. It's it's, an, it's a single sentence all the way through. It ends with a question mark. It's a long sentence. But this very skillful writer, here's how she, she asks the question. Was there a moment known only to God when all the stars held their breath, when the galaxies paused in their dance for a fraction of a second? And the Word who had called it all into being went with all his love into the womb of a young girl. And the universe started to breathe again. And the ancient harmonies resumed their song. And the angels clapped for joy. Was there a moment like that? Wow, what did we just read? He made himself nothing. There's that moment. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a slave being made in human likeness. Oh, holy night. The stars are brightly shining. Shining where? On a hill. Not on a hill far away, but on a, on a, on a hill outside old little town of Bethlehem. And not only were the angels clapping for joy that night, they were singing for joy. Are you kidding? And guess what? They did that whole, they did that whole pantomime for a ragtag bunch of lowly, humble shepherds. There's got to be a lesson in this somewhere. I mean, we're talking about lowly shepherds. Do you know that in the, in the society of that day, the only rung in the social ladder lower than shepherd is leper? They're that low. And they're squatting around this spark-strewn fire, starry, starry night. And they're wondering, when will Messiah come and deliver us from the bottom rung of life? And boom, the heavens explode in light and song, and we know the song, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill to all. Desire of Ages actually describes this moment as the brightest picture ever beheld by human eyes. Woke up this morning at 4.15. Our power went out last night. You're lucky. Yours didn't. <laughs> 10 to 10. It went out because the clock was stopped. 10 to 10. Woke up at 4.15. As dark as dark can be. I went down to have worship. Darker than dark. No light from my stereo. No light from the computer. No light from the printer. No light at all. Can you imagine going from a starry, starry night? Dark that would be. To the, the brightest, the brightest picture ever beheld by human eyes. There will only be one picture yet to come that will be brighter. And what do you suppose that will be? When the same angels return with the same Christ child. It will be the brightest. It will be brighter than that one. Every angel in the universe will be on hand. Oh, my. All of that for a ragtag band of earthy, humble shepherds, persons of a low station being granted such a high calling. There must be a lesson in this somewhere, because maybe in its own sort of way, that is the truth of Christmas that Paul is capturing here, the high calling of a low station, the high calling of a low station. When men of a low station receive the highest calling, or flip it around, when the, when the God of the highest station moves to the lowest station. Either way, unbelievable. 
Wesley Hill, in a wonderful piece, short piece, titled What It Means to Be God, writes that there are two ways to read the Christmas carol, all right? There are two ways to read it. Now, the, the, the first way is the way we all read it, and there's nothing wrong with the way we all read it. And, and how is the way we all read it? So let me put uh, Wesley Hill on the screen. Here's the way we read it. We just did. The mighty Son of God who together with his Father brought creation into being, subsequently deigned, he stooped to become a lowly human being. Yes, sir, that's the way we read it. The equivalent of a powerful monarch being reduced to a scuttling beetle. Wow. Well, that's the right way to read it. He goes out. In other words, he says, despite sharing equality, this is how we read it, despite sharing equality with God the Father, nevertheless, Jesus the Son chose to give up that status for us. Is that a correct way to read Philippians 2? It absolutely is. We do it all the time. But, but Wesley Hill says, there's another way to read this. And I'd never seen this before. Let me share it with you. But the original language is ambiguous, and it's possible. Paul might easily have meant something subtly different, and you got to catch this. Because Christ was in the form of God, therefore, he emptied himself because God's character is self-giving love all the way down, so to speak. Now, what's he telling us? Here's what he's telling us. Christ chose the self-emptying because self-emptying humility is the natural response of self-sacrificing love, and God has been self-sacrificing love from stem to stern. He has always been self-sacrificing love, has he not? That is why God today is the most humble being in this universe. He is the most humble being alive. Philip Yancey calls him the shy God. Oh, I like that. The humblest of all gods is our God. Jesus wanted to be close to us, and this was the only way his self-emptying love could find. So he comes this way. Highest calling of all, lowliest station of all. And by the way, that's not only true at the cradle. That's true at the cross, because it gets even lowlier at Calvary. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Could it be we have been called to the same self-giving humility and love? Could that be? Maybe that's Paul's point. Maybe this is what Paul is hoping we'll catch. Our high calling is to his low station, meaning our highest calling is to seek his lowliest station just like Jesus. That's it. Learn from me. Come on. Boy, in this season of the pandemic, this semester has ended and we're all hanging, uh, you know, we're just, we're just yeah, really, we're, we're, our, our tongues are hanging out. How did, we, how did we even make it? We don't know. We're worn. We're worn out. We need to hear the words of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28. And everybody knows Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? I'll give you rest. But notice the next line. It's the next line. We need that rest. Wonder if, it's, wonder if this is how to get that rest. Read this. Learn of me, Jesus says, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest, rest for your souls. My, 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 my. Our high calling is to seek his low station, meaning our highest calling is his lowliest station, just like Jesus. That's it. That's how you get rest, by the way. You take the lowliest station. That's how you get rest. You want rest worn as we are after this pandemic two semester? Oh, please. That's how you get it. That's the secret to inner quiet to inner peace, to this inside rest in the midst of this turbulent storm. Learn of me, for I am gentle. What is it? I am gentle and humble in heart. I want you to listen now to a psychologically inspiring observation. The classic on the life of Jesus, Desire of Ages. This is something else. In the heart of Christ, 
where reigned perfect harmony with God, there was perfect peace. How do we know that? Well, just watch. He was never elated by applause nor dejected by censure or disappointment. Guess what? We are the exact opposite of Jesus. We are, in, we are pumped when we have applause. We are elated with applause. Of course, we feign humility. No, 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 no. Please, please, please. Don't, don't clap. Just throw money instead. We are pumped by applause, and we are dejected by criticism. Somebody comes along and challenges you. Somebody comes along and speaks a word. That's not good what you did. I disagree with you. That cuts us to the core. Why? Because you touched numero uno. And my, my life is spent defending numero uno. And I'll not receive that from you. No, I will not. Many marriages break up right there. Right there. Can't, neither one, bake, neither one will, bake, will back down. Neither one. Yep. Numero uno wins. And both numero unos are broken. You can't win. You cannot win with numero uno. You see, we, we, self is our bottom line. That's what keeps us going. And if self gets ruffled, oh, man, we get nuts in our stomach. We get fear in our hearts. We get, we get pain in our, uh, in our thinking processes. Self is our bottom line. Jesus wasn't. <laughs> hey, he was never elated by applause. I don't know what you're plotting about. This is just me. I do everything for my father. You want to thank somebody? Thank you. Oh, a demoniac is racing at him. You remember this? The demoniac is racing at him. This demoniac is going to, the demoniac is going to tear him to pieces. And Jesus says, perfect peace. Why? Because if it's my time to go, go ahead. God will stop. God will stop this. Stop. That was it. Never elated by applause, dejected by disappointment, danger. We don't have to live a life of fear. We don't have to live a life of apprehension. We don't have to live a life with a knot in the stomach. We can be just like Jesus. Learn from me, he says, boys and girls. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Yep. Ah, oh, and boy, here comes the psychological stinger now. This is where the wisdom follows us. The next line, I'll put it on the screen for you. It is the love of self that brings unrest. Now, you can get your PhD in psychology and eventually discover that. But it'll still be true if you believe it right now. The reason we have unrest is because we're defending something. My reputation. I am somebody. Don't you ever treat me like I'm a nobody. We have to have that. But it is the love of self that brings that unrest. Do I? Get off your high horse. Get off. Just walk like everybody else. Just walk with me. Learn from me. I'm gentle and humble and hard. You'll be fine. It isn't about you anyway. Everything's about me. That's why I called you. That's why I gave you the gifts you have, because it's all about me. And I knew your gifts would tell me the story of me the best. And that's why I need you. Once I step out of that, it's about numero uno and into nothing, then not I suddenly something. When I get to nothing, I become something. But when I try to protect my something, I end up with nothing. It's upside down. That's what we're being told. Oh, but if, if it ended right there, I'd be sad. But no, no, no. Except I do need to say this. That love of self stuff. That's why this self-driven culture of politics and entertainment and competition is so ferociously deadly to our souls because we watch it. We imbibe it. We feast on it. And then the devil says, good. I want you to be just like that. You understand that, boy? You just be like that, and you'll be fine. Stick up for yourself. Don't let them walk on you. Come on. Kid them back. The love of self is why we have such unrest. 
If we feed on the narcissism of politics and the self-adulation and self-worship of the entertainment and sports worlds, we will become as dysfunctional as they. It is the love of self that brings unrest. Is there any hope? Yes, there is. Next line, when we are born from above, the same mind will be in us. Oh, I love this. The same mind will be in us that was in Jesus. The mind that led him to humble himself that we might be saved. Keep reading. Then we shall not be seeking the highest place. We shall desire to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. Begin your day at the feet of Jesus, and that's about the best posture there is. Every day, just begin at the feet of Jesus. You have nothing to prove. We already believe you are of great worth. Doing one more thing will not change our minds. Doing one less thing will not make us think less of you. And it's the same with heaven. You just live for me. Girl, boy, you just live for me. You'll be fine. Yeah. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. How did Paul put it in the old King James? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. That's what we want. If the highest calling of life is to take the lowliest station of life, then what do we have to fret? What do we have to fear? For we have chosen Jesus' mind to be our own. Let's read it one more time. This hymn, this great hymn, it's, it's introduced with one line, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, here comes that Christmas carol, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. No, he did not. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even all the way down to death on a cross. You see, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, it's not only necessary to kneel at his cradle. We must kneel at his cross. The cradle's not enough. The cradle only exists for the cross. And the cross exists because of the cradle. That's why the both of them go together. And by the way, he was not only, he was not only in the lowliest station of life at his birth and at his death, but everything in between. He was at that same lowliest station. He never changed. Perfect peace. Rest in his soul. No love of self. What's the solution for us? A few pages later, same book. I love this. Pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the heart that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. Isn't that good? That's worth taking home. Yeah. It cannot flourish. Not pride, not self-worship. In a heart that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. Guess what? You have come to the perfect place and time today to let this antidote pour over your soul and bring you that peace that only Jesus can give. Why? Why today? Because today we go to the cross. Never done this before. The cross at Christmas time? Yep, the cross at Christmas. Why not? Cradle and cross. Same truth. He who was the highest station of all came down to the lowliest station for the likes of you and me. Wow. It doesn't get any better than that, really. This Christmas, what I want most is that peace of Jesus. I want that rest. This has been a ragged semester for all of us. I want that rest. I want that perfect peace. The deliverance of Jesus from the unrest of the love of self. And if that's what you want, may I be the first to welcome you to the Lord's table. There it is. We're ready to go. By the way, the Lord's table was made out of the wooden cradle. It is constructed out of the wooden cradle. It is also fashioned out of the wooden cross. So in the wooden Lord's table, you have the cradle and the cross together in Christ. Yeah. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ, 
Oh, I just love that carol, Christ our Lord. Sing for us now, please. What is it about the holiday season that has given you the greatest joy? Is it the time spent cutting down the family Christmas tree at the local farm, or maybe a special ornament placed on that lighted bough? Or do you find joy in contemplating the profound meaning of the carols we sing? Maybe Christmas joy is found in the memories you make together with friends and family, and the spirit of giving that surrounds this season. As we reflect on these joys, let's always remember the great light who guides us, the one who brings joy and meaning to life, the loving Father who is at the heart of all treasured relationships, and the wonderful God who gave the ultimate gift in a newborn child. Some of my joy this season comes in part from your letters, your prayers, and your faithful giving of support to this ministry which reaches literally around the world. If you've been blessed this year, I'd like to ask you to join the many people who financially support this global New Perceptions ministry. It's simple to do. Just call our toll-free number, 877, two words, His Will. One of our friendly operators will be happy to help you. You can also click the donate link at the top of our website. 
Trust me, no gift is too small for God to use to spread the good news of His love, His sacrifice, and His future plans for our happiness. Every gift, by the way, is entirely invested in our mission to communicate God's good news to a generation who needs the hope found in Jesus, which will bring them true joy in life. So once again, the number to call is 877-HIS-WILL. This season, my wish for you is that the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace will be at the heart of the very best memories made together with your family and friends.